Thank you, Naira. Thank you for uh, the invitation this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Um, there are definitely other places that you could be. Um, so I appreciate you coming to hear me talk. Um, so by training, I'm an engineer, biomedical engineer. Um, but most recently, I've kind of found my way um, more into like looking at neuroscience uh, to some degree. So uh, the talk today is going to be a, maybe a little bit heavy um, on neuroscience kinds of things. Um, but the way I like to think about it is um, in a lot of cases, all the work that we do in engineering really informs uh, the neuroscience that I do. So all the kind of analysis techniques that I'm going to be talking about today and the kind of experimental methods and even the kind of questions that I like to ask um, basically come from an engineering kind of approach to neuroscience. Um, so I tend to like to work in the motor system uh, more than anything because, well, I think it's the best system to work in. That's my own uh, personal bias. But, um, and I always like to, to talk about the motor system from this perspective, right? If we want to do something, and, and I like to think about the upper limb more than anything, as you can kind of tell from my, my drawing here, um, we first have to decide what we want to do, right? We have to select some tasks. We're going to reach down, pick up that pizza, transport it to our mouth, right? That's kind of one kind of a control problem that we might have to do. Um, another kind of control problem would be uh, maybe if we want to pick up that, that, that can of soda or a bottle of water or something, right? There's a lot of computations that we have to make Make that go into kind of picking that up and transporting it. As the weight of the drink gets less and less, we have to kind of adapt for that across time. Right? So we're going to select that task, uh, pass it to some kind of motor controller. And then when I'm saying motor controller here, I'm really uh, talking about our brain, the part of the brain that controls movement. That's going to issue some kind of motor commands that are going to kind of go to this very highly nonlinear thing that hangs off the side of our body that's going to go ahead and make some kind of movement. Okay, right? That's the simple kind of control chain that we're going to be talking about. Um, and it wouldn't be a, a reasonably good control system if we didn't have feedback in some way. Right? We have lots of different ways to get feedback into our system. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about vision and proprioception today, uh, maybe just lightly, not so much. Right? And then we can kind of iterate through this control loop, fix errors that we make, um, kind of move along and do things like that. So the question that I'm really interested in studying from, yes, please. Okay, so I'm kind of ignorant, but... No, that's uh, fine. Yep. What is proprio... Proprioception. Oh. Proprioception is uh, the sense of if you stand there and you have the unlucky opportunity of, you know, having someone test your proprioception, they're going to ask you to close your eyes oh. and try and touch your nose. So it's the ability to know where your limbs are in space without seeing them. Um, so that's what proprioception is. So, um, so the kind of research question that I want to ask um, is to try and understand how uh, the behavioral context surrounding movement of the upper limb um, change neural activity in the parts of the brain that control movement. And I kind of want to unpack that for you a little bit from this idea of behavioral context. What do I mean? Right? There's a few different things that we could mean. One could be what kind of control strategy do I use to do what I want to do? Right. It's one thing to reach out and pick something up. That might be one kind of control strategy, something very ballistic, uh, trajectory control. Or you can imagine, right, if you're driving some of, down some of the roads, right, in fair Milwaukee, after the winter, there's lots of potholes. And if you're holding onto that steering wheel, right, your control strategy might be, I need to hold this still, even though I'm getting all these perturbations to keep my car going straight down the road. So different kinds of control strategies are going to be important. So that's one of the things that I'm kind of interested in talking about. Um, something else uh, that, that's interesting to me is how does sensory feedback, the, either the presence of sensory feedback or the absence of sensory feedback, play into um, this kind of control system? And then the third being what I'll call uh, modification of the end effector, right? So by end effector, I'm talking about the arm. And you can think of lots of different cases where our end effectors get modified, right? If we're going to go to the gym, right, we're going to lift a lot of weights. Our muscles are going to get stronger. That's going to change how we move. And it's going to require that the brain changes how it's going to control behavior. Um, on the other side, as we get older, maybe we end up with Parkinson's disease or some other kind of um, uh, uh, disability, um, that's going to change how the brain has to control this limb um, to kind of make it move. I'm going to start for a second just talking a little bit, just a kind of a cartoon example of uh, giving you a flavor of how context or changes in sensory feedback can affect uh, processing of these motor areas. So this is something that I think if you're a graduate student in this kind of area, we're all too familiar with it. Um, 
And this is basically just like the rawest of the raw data that we can get. Basically what we're doing here, we're putting an electrode down in the motor cortex. This is the part of the brain that explicitly controls how we move. That's what it is. And these are two neurons, the, the action potentials from two neurons that we're recording from that one electrode. So these are two neurons in very, very close proximity to one another. And so these are all the different action potentials that we're recording. You can kind of see them all stacked up on one another. And this is when those action potentials occurred in time. So think of this, the y-axis doesn't really mean anything here other than the fact that we're just trying to spread out where those dots occur and then just looking at how they, they evolve or unfold in time. And I take a picture of this obviously piece of paper because this is something I just always keep hanging up on the, my basically board in front of my desk because it's one of these things where you'll do an experiment sometime, you make a hypothesis, right? And you don't know if it's gonna work. This is one where I could see that my hypothesis was correct when I was looking at the rawest of the raw data. So this was something that was kind of interesting to me. So I'll draw your attention to this green neuron first. And you can see this green neuron is going along, spiking happily. So each one of these dots that you see in this panel here is an action potential. And then I kind of drew this line in here. And I think what you can kind of appreciate is it's going along maybe at some kind of rate. And then there's a kind of an increase in the density of the firing of this neuron in this time period here and this time period here. I think we can appreciate this. Something for this yellow neuron, it's going along happily and then it basically turns off. We don't see any firing for that neuron. So these are two neurons in the same part of the brain that control movement that do two completely different things during this interesting time period. So this is kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about context. So what was going on in these different two, two different time periods? So this is a little bit of whatever ex or the experimental setup that I use um, looks like is we use rhesus monkeys in this case and we're going to record the uh, neural activity from rhesus monkeys. So we kind of bring them in, we set them in a chair and then they basically have their hand in a robotic exoskeleton. So this is kind of a bottom view of the real experimental setup. Um, and they basically play video games with this robot, right? They put their arm in this robot and then they're just going to start making movements in this horizontal plane. We project some kind of a game onto a screen that they can see um, using a two-way mirror. So basically they can't see where their arm is at any point in time, but they see a kind of a proxy for where their arm is. And you're going to see that in a second. So I'm going to play this video here and give you an idea of what's going on. So this monkey is going to go ahead. He's good. So we're, we're looking from the bottom up. Here's this exoskeleton. You can see there's a target and he's just basically going to move his hand and he's going to hit that target and do it over and over and over again. And then we're going to play an interesting game with this monkey. And we trained him basically to what well, you'll see. So you see this line come up on the screen. He gets a little upset. We kind of get him back in position. And then he's just going to sit there, not move, right? And he's just going to watch what he just did. He's going to watch that target move around. And then there's a proxy for the cursor that's going to move around exactly how he just did it. And he's going to do that over and over and over again. And that's how we generated this kind of a task, this, this raster that I'm going to call it here. So this time period, actually this yellow time period, or this yellow neuron, so these time periods here is a time period where he was observing what was going on just by feeling how his arm moved around. Okay? So that's what was happening in this time period here. Whereas in these time periods here, he was using his visual acuity to observe what was going on. So what we see going on here, and I kind of broke it down a little bit differently here, is that we've got some neurons. So this is just the firing rate of a neuron that's changing over. Uh, this is on the order of 45 minutes across this whole thing as he's doing different tasks. In a condition blue where he's actually moving his arm around, physically moving his arm around, you can see this neuron likes blue conditions. Its firing rate will go down. It doesn't do much in the other conditions. Pops up a little bit in this blue condition here. Pops up a little bit in this blue condition here. There's another condition where this he's holding still, just watching what's going on on the screen. And that's this yellow neuron. It's not doing much. And then every time you see a yellow condition, it kind of pokes its head up. So now these are neurons in the part of the brain that controls how we move. We're not moving here but it's, there's still something going on. Context is changing how these neurons are behaving. And then again, we've got this neuron that's proprioceptive related. So he's not seeing anything on the screen. His arm is just being moved around by these, this robot that he's, uh, that he's got his arm in. And you can see this neuron's not doing much. And then in these gray periods, it picks up and picks up and picks up. So we've got these neurons that are doing much different things and we can appreciate over all the 
80 some neurons that we recorded, we see very heterogeneous behavior in this part of the brain that controls movement that's not only related to movement, but rather visual feedback and kind of sensory feedback as well. So these are kind of some of the ideas that I'm thinking about when I'm talking about context. Um, kind of the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on a couple of the other segments here. Uh, the first being uh, the selection of control strategies and modification of the end effector. So I guess I'll talk about the goals of this talk a little bit. Can I, can I yes, please, please. So one of the things that, that I worry about mm -hmm. a lot and the work I do are, are levels of description. Okay. And, and so that seems to be appropriate here. What, you know, there's behavior, what level of description of that behavior, how, I mean, how, how high a level of description of the behavior can you map that neural activity to? I guess that's my question. So um, I, think, or, I think we'll answer that a little bit as we go along. Okay. Um, I mean, it's like the you can you can map it to very overt parameters of movement. Some neurons prefer moving to the left. Some neurons prefer moving to the right. Some will prefer forces in one direction versus the other, and all kinds of different variations in between. Very heterogeneous kinds of. Okay, and and I and in the sort of the the context ladenness yep. of the description is sort of akin to if I said the difference between gray there yep. or shirt there. Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. And, and, and those are the very, uh, those are the kind of questions that I'm interested in, right? Is because we, cool. fi we find ourselves in, in lots of different situations, right? And these areas are so densely connected and have so many nodes, right? And sensory input or I guess inputs to these areas from so many different places, we don't understand how, right, what, how many other neurons one neuron is connected to. Um, so that what that neuron might do in one context might be completely what it does in another context just because of all the different kinds of input it's receiving from other things. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit today um, is um, going to be to try and relate some spatiotemporal activity in the cortex um, to the initiation of movement. So the process of, of going ahead and actually starting to move is a very interesting one. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit from looking at local field potentials. These are slow oscillations that we measure in the brain on the order of 35, 45, anywhere up to 100 hertz or something like that, as well as the kind of spiking activity, the action potentials um, as well. Um, so we're going to and what I'm going to show you is that if we interfere with some of the spatiotemporal patterns of activity in the cortex, that we're going to be able to disrupt movement, movement initiation. And then I'm going to kind of um, try and uh, link the kind of uh, spatiotemporal activity that we're going to see in the cortex here. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an explanation why I think we need to activate cortex in such a way to control this like really nonlinear thing that hangs off the side of our body. Okay. So maybe a little bit of background to start. Um, the part of the brain that we're going to record from here is called the uh, primary, mostly the primary motor cortex. Um, and this is kind of a um, study from John Rothwell that he did back in the, the mid-90s, where they basically used uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation in this case to basically stimulate neurons in motor cortex. And while they were stimulating those neurons in motor cortex, they um, either, or they recorded the electromyographic activity either from the biceps muscle, right? Either from the biceps, right? The muscle on your, your hand or the hypothenar muscle on the side of the hand, right? And they would also stimulate uh, the cervical spine too, uh, basically uh, the part of the spinal cord that's going to control that muscle activity. So what we're showing here is basically um, these lines up and down is where stimulation was delivered um, either to the motor cortex or the cervical spine, here for the biceps muscle and the hypothenar muscle. And so you can see measuring the muscle activity, either in the biceps or the hypothenar, we're seeing muscle activity directly evoked by stimulation. So if we stimulate this part of the brain that I'm recording from with electrical stimulation or or magnetic stimulation, we're going to evoke activity in the periphery, right? So if I took one of these things and gave you a little shock right around this part of your brain, right, your arm's going to start just kind of moving because that's just what it does, right? That's how we're wired up. That's what we do, right? So this is the part of the brain, the kind of uh, output of the brain that's going to control movement. And if we actually look 
at what neurons do in this part of the brain, um, trying to come back to this idea of description, being able to describe neurons. If we look at single neurons, this is a study from Apostolos Georgiopoulos, um, who was describing um, how the activity of one neuron changed when a monkey, in this case, was either making movements to the left, to the right, away from him or back, kind of fore, aft, left, right kind of movement. So um, what would be called center out movement. So basically when the monkey made the movement to the right, this neuron was firing along happily. This is where the movement happened. It got very quiet and then it kind of started firing after the movement was over again. Whereas if this monkey moved to the left, it was firing along happily, got to the place where the movement was happening, started to fire a lot more, right? And then when the movement was over, quieted down. So basically what he showed here is that this neuron preferred movements kind of made to the left. This was a neuron that coded whenever that monkey wanted to make a movement to the left. So these are ideas um, that have kind of um, helped the, the, the field, um, the study of motor cortex evolve across time, looking at their, their ability, our ability to kind of describe them. This is some more recent work from Mark, Mark Churchland, where instead of looking at single neurons and trying to describe their temporal dynamics, he's looking at 100, 100 or so neurons at the same time. So right, you've got this very highly high dimensional space, maybe 75, 85, 95 dimensions, and he's trying to boil down that neural activity down to a couple of dimensions, right? So trying to represent the activity of 100 neurons in just two dimensions. And so for many different subjects in this case, doing relatively similar tasks, basically, basically what he can see is very orderly temporal dynamics. So the way to kind of interpret these plots is where the dots start, that's about time zero. And then as these lines uh, emanate from these dots, that's time unfolding and how this kind of neural activity is unfolding in this two-dimensional space as a function of time. So you can see across all of these subjects that he examined, we see some variation in the starting point, right, where, where these kinds of high-dimensional representations take place. But they all kind of evolve across time with very, very orderly dynamics where they're all kind of doing the same kind of thing. So we can see there's very well-defined temporal dynamics uh, in the motor cortex, but the question becomes, what about spatial structure, right? We've got a brain, right? That brain has to map onto our body in some kind of way, and that's called the homunculus. And so we have a very well-defined homunculus, uh, both for motor cortex and sensory cortex, such that if I came and I kind of did a little bit of, uh, say, electrical stimulation, right, at this part of the brain, basically right at the top of your brain, almost right in the middle, right, your leg might start. You might, muscles in your leg might move. Where if I come kind of way down, almost on the side of the brain by your ear, and we would do some electrical stimulation there, you might see some twitches kind of in your face, things like that. The part of the brain that I'm recording from is kind of up in this elbow, forearm, wrist kind of hand area of motor cortex. So if we would provide electrical stimulation there, we would see, um, movement of muscles in the, in the arm and the hand. Uh, if we do some more detailed study, uh, this is work from Peter Strick's lab, uh, where they actually um, look at the projections of these neurons onto muscles. So what muscle explicitly does a single neuron control? We can see there's a very well-defined orderly structure kind of across the motor cortex, such that we have neurons that are, are uh, defined for controlling shoulder kind of movements up here. Uh, this is, would be more um, uh, medial, a little more lateral to that, neurons that would control the elbow, and then a little more lateral to that, um, neurons that would control the finger. Um, and so this is up on the surface of the brain. Um, this kind of area here is as we kind of start to come, I should say, down into this, in this kind of sulcal area, right? One of these uh, infolds of the brain. So we can see there's this very orderly kind of spatial pattern of neuron organization in the brain as well. So we've got spatial temporal dynamics that kind of unfold across time. So the question is, is there anything that we can learn about how the brain functions from these spatial temporal dynamics? So the way we go and do that is we implant uh, what's called a Utah electrode array. Um, and I've, we're, we're implanting these in, in different areas. So um, from an engineering perspective, these are about four millimeters by four millimeters uh, with shank lengths on the order of a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. So we take these, lay them on the surface and actually gently press them into the surface of the brain. So we're recording from uh, inside the brain uh, with, these, uh, with these electrodes. 
um, an idea of kind of where in the brain uh, we're recording from. Uh, you, guess you can take my word for it that we're in motor cortex. And the kind of activity that we're going to record is going to look like this. So uh, these should look like action potentials that I showed you earlier. You can see that we're recording many, many, many of them at the same time. Lots of different uh, spikes, different information uh, with, with very high signal-to-noise ratios in this case. These are signal-to-noise ratios on the order of oh, 10 or 15 or something like that which is uh, rather remarkable for these kinds of uh, experiments. So very high fidelity um, activity in this case. Um, a little bit about the experimental paradigm I'm going to talk about today. I've talked about the, the monkey um, kind of setup already. The task we're going to have the monkey do is the center out task, the same one that Georgopoulos talked about. And it looks something like this. Uh, this is kind of simplified. The monkey's going to have a target. It's going to be kind of in the center of his workspace. And he's going to sit there and wait for about 500 milliseconds. A target is going to appear in the periphery for a per certain period of time. It's going to flash when he's supposed to start to move. And then he's going to make a movement to that target, hold for a brief period of time, and then come back to the center and do that over and over and over again in a bunch of different directions. So if we were to look at it schematically, it's going to look like this. He's going to hold in the center. A target is going to appear in the periphery after um, between 1,000 and 1,500 milliseconds. Uh, that target is going to start to flash. Uh, that's going to be his cue to move. He's going to have some reaction time. His movement is going to begin. He's going to make that movement to that target, hold out there in the periphery, hit the target, hold there, and then he's going to get some reward at the end of the target, applesauce or juice or something like that, something that he likes. And we're, what I'm really interested in here is looking at the neural activity during this instruction period before the movement starts and then while, right around the time when movement is going to begin, when, when neural activity is going to take place. And the first thing I want to talk about is local field potentials. So these are these electrodes, right, placed in the cortex, right, and we can measure the spiking activity like I've shown. That's very high frequency activity in the thousands of hertz usually. Um, but we can also measure these low frequency fluctuations. So in here I'm, I'm using what's called the, the Betel local field potential. If you're familiar with EEG at all, these are kind, uh, these kinds of bands of, of slow oscillations in, in brain signals are named from EEG literature after Greek, Greek letters. But here we're thinking about 15 to 30 hertz oscillations uh, in these frequencies. So you can see we might have some very kind of high frequency data here. Um, and if we bandpass filter those, uh, between uh, this 50 uh, or 15 and 30 hertz oscillation, right, we're going to see um, a relatively um, lower, I should say, a lower frequency oscillation. And then if we just do a Hilbert transform um, on that oscillation and then just look at the magnitude of that oscillation across time, we can extract that envelope, right? And basically we're going to do that on a bunch of different trials in this case and then line up all those trials and we can, what we're going to, see this, uh, this waveform here that we're going to call uh, the beta attenuation, right? So it's a, it's a relatively well-known phenomenon that around the time that movement is going to begin in the motor cortex, this, the power in this beta frequency band is going to drop precipitously. And we see that very nicely. Um, so like I said, we use the Hilbert transform to, to estimate that beta amplitude. And really what we wanted to try and understand is if there was some spatio-temporal relationship in this uh, beta attenuation across the array, right? So does it start here and then propagate over here? Does it start here and propagate over here? Is it random? Does it not matter? So these are the things that we were interested in here. Um, so what I'm showing here in this cartoon is for electrode 4. That's this electrode over here. Electrode 44, this one in the middle. And then electrode 87, right? So I'm showing the beta attenuation um, with respect to when movement begins on those four electrodes. And I think what you can see here is it appears that the blue one starts first, then you get the green one taking place, and then finally you get the red one after the, after the fact, right? So we're seeing this kind of spatiotemporal organization or neur neurons over here doing something, then neurons over here doing something, and then neurons over here doing something, right? Uh, Yep, please. Are these patterns generalizable across different monkeys? Stay tuned for two slides. <laughs> um, this is the big question. Right? This, is, this, is, this is the question, right. So um, the way we're going to try and uncover that, if there's actually some organization that we, can do, that we can deduce there, is to just really fit a very simple linear model, right? We're going to take um, 
the row and column organization of an electrode where we recorded a signal and we're going to try and map that onto the time that this uh, attenuation crossed this threshold, right? We set an arbitrary threshold. Whenever this time takes place, we're gonna log that time. So we're gonna basically try and predict the attenuation time based on the location of the electrode on the array. And if we do that across a bunch of monkeys, uh, we see something that's, that's relatively predictable. We can see for this, this animal here, um, these electrodes start the earliest and then it kind of progresses across the array to that side. Uh, in this second animal, starting here, progressing across the array to that side. In this animal, starting over here, progressing across that array to that side. In this animal, doing the same kind of thing. So these are very generalizable phenomena. All of the animals that we've looked at, I show four here, we've looked at six, eight, ten animals. Uh, we've done this in humans as well. You see similar kinds of things in humans. Um, we don't stick electrodes in humans' brains. Those are usually people who are in the hospital having recordings done for other reasons. Um, but, but they generalize there as well. And what we found is quite interesting, is that though they don't always propagate in exactly the same direction, they always propagate along the exact same axis. Okay? So this is a, a, a very prominent landmark in the brain called the central sulcus. It's right next to the motor cortex for all these animals. And what you can see here is that all of these propagation patterns are basically perpendicular to the central sulcus, either propagating out or away. So it seems like there's something about that axis into and out of the central sulcus uh, that end up being important. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about how we um, made sure what we weren't seeing is artifact in this case, right? So at least for this animal here, we, we found that there was a very significant regression, I think on the order of 0.7, the R squared for this 2D regression model that we fit in this case. So we had a, a relatively good uh, a regression uh, fit, right? Um, but what we did is uh, to try and, and, and assess the statistical significance of that regression is basically to spatially scramble those electrodes, right? So instead of basically scramble the row and column mapping of that. So we're basically shuffling this data set, or data set around. And we do that about 10,000 times, right? And then basically estimate the distribution of the um, R squared coefficient for those shuffled fits, right? So if we move those electrodes around all over the place, we should break this spatial pattern that we see. And we, in fact, do that, right? So you see that there's almost no R squared for all those 10,000 shuffles that we did, right? So we have a very highly significant R squared in this case. We do something similar where we basically then subs or break our data set up into trials that were in the first half, trials in the second half, estimate that for both sets of trials, right? And that's what we get in this, um, this blue distribution here. And we look at basically the propagation direction for both of those halves. And, and they're really quite similar uh, in, a lot of the, in a lot of these cases. But then we do the same procedure that we did in this other case is we take the first half and then we take the second half, shuffle the second half, and look at the similarity between the propagation directions. And that's what this gray distribution is in here. So we see a very highly significant dis uh, difference between these two, different, these two distributions saying to us that... Um, um, this really is an artifact. This is a real spatiotemporal um, propagation that we're seeing across these, these, these electrodes in these field potentials. Um, but what about spiking activity, right? We can look at these, these the, fire, the firing rates of individual neurons, three different neurons, happening to be on those electrodes that I showed you before um, for different directions, and I'm just kind of there's, there's nothing interesting about the y-axis in this case other than the fact that we're looking at different movement directions. And we can take those and kind of take means across the directions and estimate what the average firing rate for that neuron was for movements up, so green movements up, purple movements down, um, and then use um, a mutual, in, or basically an uh, information theory to try and understand when this neuron was most active with respect to movement onset. So we're using a measure of entropy in this case, right? So entropy, the amount of randomness that's in a system. So we would expect this, these neurons to get less random the closer they were to um, initiating a movement, okay? And that's exactly what you see, that entropy is kind of ticking along, it reaches a, reaches a minimum where that cell 
becomes most informative about behavior, right? And then I'll go back to some baseline. It's going to hit some minimum and going to hit some minimum. And what I'll ask you to, under, to, to kind of remember is, right, this, neuro, this electrode was furthest to the left. This one was in the middle. This one was furthest to the right. And what you can see is this neuron is most informative earlier than this neuron. And then is that one's more informative earlier than that neuron. So we're not only seeing a progression of activity with respect to the field potentials, but we see it in the spiking activity as well, right? Where we see um, if we kind of, it's a bit more noisy for spikes because that's just the inherent nature of spikes. Um, but we see that these spatiotemporal fits work for the spiking activity much the same way that they do for the uh, local field potentials. So these are spikes from one monkey, the LFP from one monkey, right? And those are columns. So we can see that the LFP in this monkey propagates this way, the spikes propagate that way. So if we would plot those two vectors on top of the, each other, that's what they look like. Similar for here, similar for here. So we see spiking activity and field potentials doing the same thing. Interestingly, um, if we look during that instruction period, that preparation period where the monkey's just holding still and not doing anything, we don't see any kind of patterned activity. So this is something that's, that's unique to the process of actively initiating a movement and starting to move the arm. So it's not just um, a, a, a property of cortical neurons. So what we wanted to do then is really try and understand well, is this really something that's important for initiating movement? If we didn't have this kind of thing happening, could we still initiate a movement? So the, the experiment that we wanted to um, take a look at there was to try and establish some kind of a causal link between the spatiotemporal pattern and movement initiation. Um, and what our hypothesis was is that if we disrupted this progression, we would uh, disrupt movement initiation in some way. So basically what we did is we saw this beta attenuation threshold. And we came in and we decided we're going to electrically stimulate the cortex spatiotemporally um, at a few different times, either long before uh, movement onset, uh, so this is long before movement onset, around when movement onset happens, or after movement onset. Um, so basically we gave trains of pulses, uh, electrical pulses, um, on the order of um, they were about 10 microamps or something like that delivered right into the brain. 200 microsecond phases at about 250 uh, hertz. Um, and importantly, what we did is we tried to align the electrical stimulation with the pattern of progression of this neural activity. So in this animal here, right, his neural activity or his spatiotemporal pattern, beta attenuation orientation, I guess you could say, was kind of up and to the right. So what we decided to do was apply three different patterns of stimulation. One that started at the bottom left and moved to the upper right. So you could say with the pattern of beta attenuation. Um, one that started at the upper right and moved to the bottom left against that pattern. And then one that was completely random with respect to time. Maybe it started uh, where it started here and then went here and then you know here and then here and then kind of moved all over. Okay? So, our, so our hypothesis was um, if anything, right, we should see a disruption in the initiation of movement because we're going to be applying, applying electrical activity in the opposite direction that this, um, this inherent activity of cortex uh, is going to be um, propagating along. So what I wanted to show uh, briefly was this, right? I told you earlier, right, if that you provide electrical stimulation to these parts of the brain, something happens in the periphery, right? You get a twitch, you get a muscle twitch, or something like this. We purposely def def uh, defined our stimuli such that they were below the threshold to elicit, elicit those kinds of activity. So what I'm showing you here is, right, this is just normal movement. Um, actually, let me go one more slide. So no stim with against random. So, right, so this is no stimulation with the direction of stimulation against the direction of attenuation and then that random. So you can see that this is just looking at the velocity of movements across time, right? So we move, velocity goes up, and as we slow down, velocity comes down. And you can see that all of these lines uh, lie on top of one another. So we weren't perturbing movement in any way uh, with our stimulation, okay? Um, I guess 
In the interest of time, I'm just going to explain this middle section. So this is when we applied stimulation right around the time when beta attenuation, that, that kind of spatiotemporal pattern, takes place. And if we look at um, the relative reaction time, how long it took the monkey to initiate his movement, we can see that we significantly increase the reaction time when we stimulate against that direction of propagation. So when we can kind of disrupt that spatiotemporal activity in the cortex, we can delay, at least, we can't in completely inhibit, but we can delay the progression of activity. If we I guess I would hypothesize if we would stimulate for longer periods of time, we would be able to kind of uh, eliminate that activity. So um, this is um, basically direct evidence that this spatial temporal progression of activity is necessary to uh, elicit or at least initiate movement. So uh, that was the first part of the talk that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to skip ahead for a second. And just go. So uh, we'll start here. So that first block diagram I talked was talked about was a little bit simplified. Um, right? We've got task selection. We've got the brain kind of doing its thing. Turns out, right, that the brain is more complicated than just a block. There's lots of different things that we can think about uh, that go into providing those kinds of motor commands that we need to move the arm. We need to select an action, plan the movement, generate the commands. These kinds of tasks are definitely, are usually attributed to different brain areas. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk about briefly now, is how can we then go ahead and uh, parse in some way, shape, or form these different actions that go into creating a command and try and understand how that relates to behavior. So if we think about action selection and movement planning, those are usually thought about as tasks that happen a little forward in the brain from the motor cortex, usually in something called the premotor cortex, where this kind of command generation is in this area of the brain that I've been telling you about all the time called the motor cortex. And so what we did in this case, um, I guess I'll say this. So um, the general thought across time is that these premotor areas don't really represent movement as strongly as the motor cortex. They're like higher up the level of abstraction, so they do kind of higher level tasks where the motor cortex kind of deals with the nitty gritty of what's going on with the arm and things like that. So really this last part I wanted to talk about uh, or address a couple of questions. Um, the first is to try and understand if the uh, responses in premotor cortex um, look like those in motor cortex have maybe a very low level representation or are consistent with this old hypothesized idea of having a very high level or ex extrinsic representation. So extrinsic, am I moving up, down, left or right versus intrinsic, am I controlling a muscle, am I controlling a force or something like this. And so can we see things in the population activity that look like this. So if we look at movements, um, I guess this is what movements look like. We're having right, these monkeys make these eight movements in eight different directions. If we pick one to the left here, um, I'm showing in gray here, or in the dashed line is Y uh, velocity. In the uh, black line is the X velocity. So you can see we get very nice velocity profiles for movements to the left. The joint torques at the shoulder and elbow change. The joint velocities at the shoulder and elbow change as we would expect them to change too. Um, things that we expect to be uh, extrinsic, we would expect to be represented uniformly in space, right? So velocity is an extrinsic variable. We're either moving left, right, up, and down. It doesn't change much whether we move right, left, up, or down. Very, uh, very much a uniform distribution. Things like joint velocity are very intrinsic kinds of representations. They end up being represented non-uniformly in space. So the question is, is do we see neural activity that is uniform in space or non-uniform in space in these areas? So in this case, we're recording from lots of different areas. I think this is um, almost 2,000 different neural uh, recordings. Similar kinds of tasks that, that I talked about before, center out task, interested in the instruction period and the movement period. Um, so these are kinds of neural responses that, that we can record. Um, 
So, right, we've got different directions of movement. This is during the instruction period. This is when movement starts. So we can see neurons maybe in primary motor cortex are sitting there quiet. They do something during the instruction period that looks like it's slightly different for movement direction. And then we get this very widely varying activity um, around the movement time that's definitely varying by the direction of movement. Uh, I told you before that there's some neurons that prefer moving certain directions versus the other. That's what I'm showing you here. So this neuron, during the movement period, likes movements kind of up and to the right, whereas during the reaction time and the instruction period, like movements up and to the left. In premotor cortex, in all three of those time periods, this neuron does about the same thing. And then we can see something, again, different, very heterogeneous again. Um, in, uh, in this, pre this other premotor area. So I'm going to come back to this slide. Or not come back to this slide, or talk about this slide briefly. Um, so this is taking those directional representations for each of those neurons, and then plotting them as a circular histogram, right? So the length of this line is directly proportional to how many neurons I found that liked movements in that direction, right? The length of this line is how many neurons I recorded from liked movements up, okay? So we're basically plotting those as circular histograms here. For the primary motor area, dorsal premotor cortex, ventral premotor cortex, right? And I'm gonna come back to this uh, talk about intrinsic or extrinsic versus intrinsic kinds of representations again. So if we kind of look at these shapes that we get from these distributions, I'll submit to you that I think they all kind of look ex or very intrinsic, right? They kind of have bimodal distributions. They're not very uniform. They're not quite uniform in space. And that's exactly what we're showing with these yellow lines in this case. Um, those are the uh, significant or the, the uh, directional specificity or the orientation of those distributions that we found were significant with a Raleigh test in this case. And what I really thought was interesting thinking about right how these progressions change as a function of time is to track this yellow orientation or, or what the, the angle of that orientation is as we start very early before movement takes place as movement takes place and then after movement takes place so for these three areas primary motor cortex dorsal premotor cortex and pmv I'm just going to focus on PM1 in this case, the primary motor area. You can see that this representation is very stable at, say, 170 degrees. And it stays stable up until about 200 or 300 milliseconds before movement starts. But right about the time that movement is initiated, almost exactly looking like that beta attenuation thing that I showed you earlier, right? you see this very huge change in this uh, population level activity, the orientation of this distribution changes, right? From here all the way down to here, right around the time that movement starts, which I thought was very interesting and kind of looks like those temporal dynamics I showed you earlier, where they're starting in a place, right? And then they're all kind of emanating and rotating and changing as a function of time. So I wanted to kind of ascribe some uh, relevance or some meaning to um, what was going on in that, in, with, with that kind of temporal change in this population, hundreds of neurons, uh, the activity. And so to do that, I basically simulated a, net, a neural network model that controlled the physical model of the arm. So the physical mod model of the arm was just a two-link arm, almost exactly the same thing that we're actually having the monkey to do. It was fixed here at the shoulder, it had an elbow, and then it had an endpoint, and it needed to basically reach in eight directions, the same task that we were having the animal to do. And it did that through the use of uh, six different muscle actuators that we coded in here. So uh, there was basically muscle actuators for the triceps muscles, uh, for the biceps muscles, and then for some muscles that control the shoulder, basically uh, different kinds of muscles. And basically what we did in this network model is we had a bunch of uh, neurons in a, in a neural network. We gave them some kind of task. We gave them state feedback. State feedback in that case, how far away am I from my target? We simulated that those, those neurons, ran them through this uh, biomechanics model that we had, and they just had them reach many, 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 many times. Um, this is the cost function that we used um, to try and uh, optimize our model. So uh, the cost was basically um, the difference between where we wanted to be and where we are, um, and then basically trying to minimize 
uh, neural activity, muscle activity, and then the weights that connect the different neurons in that case. If we look at the network model, uh, it was a two-layer neural network model that basically generated neural activities that got transformed into muscle activities. Those muscle activities were transformed um, basically into joint torques, into velocities, and then into positions. Um, and really what we were interested in trying to understand here is, right, you in this case, you is um, basically uh, the output of transforming neural activities or actually the activities the neural drive to those six different muscles and transforming those actually into basically, um, I guess, force relationships in that muscle or the, the actual output of those muscles. And we can take that output of those muscles and transform them into torques at the joints um, through this matrix, basically H. And basically the matrix H in this case um, is a nonlinear matrix that represents the physiological pr properties of the muscles. So muscles are nonlinear. Um, their force output changes as a, f as a factor of how fast we're moving. So there's a very nonlinear relationship. If you move faster, too fast, the force output will go down. If you move too slow, the force output goes down. Um, but up in, in the kind of, there's an optimal range for how fast we move uh, to generate the most force. Um, Force is also related to the length of the muscle, right? When our muscle is relatively short, we can pull harder than when it's very, very long. Anyone ever done a pull-up before? I've tried to do pull-ups all the time and I'm very unsuccessful. It's a lot easier to do a pull-up if you start in this position than if you start in that position, right? That's the force, uh, force length property of muscles. So we did two different simulations here. One where we just had a linear muscle model, so basically activation is directly related to torque through this matrix M. Matrix M. Or we had a nonlinear model that tried to represent the physical system where U is related to T through this nonlinearity as well. So we simulated all these neurons and then we came up with these same distributions that I just showed you before for motor cortex. So for this linear muscle model, what's important to see, right, is this yellow line really doesn't move very much as a function of time as we move along. Right? So the start of movement is here, here's before the start of movement moving along. Whereas when we use this nonlinear, right, we, we try and uh, model the physiology of the muscles, we can see that there is a temporal progression in that yellow line that kind of looks like this. And we see something very similar to what we see in physiology. So what this says to me, uh, I, I'm actually gonna just conclude on this slide. Um, so what this says, right, is that there's something about the properties of muscles, the properties of the end effector, right, that are very important to the brain, right, in changing how the brain functions to control that arm, right? So the brain has a very intimate knowledge of this arm and how this arm works, right, and changes its neural activity to take into account the properties of those muscles, the force length property, the force velocity property of muscles, right? And we saw earlier, right, that we see this spatial temporal pattern of activation across cortex. So really what I think is going on, and we're running experiments now to try and really kind of firm these things up, is this temporal activity that we see in these populations of neurons comes about, and this propagation of this neural activity across this array comes about to activate neurons at a very specific time in a very specific way so that we can take into account these force length or actually the nonlinear, the properties of the muscles that are, are important to kind of uh, help us to move along. So with that, I'm gonna stop, uh, acknowledge all the, the collaborators that I've had on this project, um, the different funding uh, sources that we have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hmm? Not too terrible. Sure. Okay, so this is not really, this is not really my area, but yep. it's very, very interesting. Yep. And um, so, basically, two questions. Yep. One of the things I'm sort of obsessed about. And with respect to the movement sciences is the idea about what the unit of analysis is and, and, and quality of movement. And so my, my, you know, when I look at these, these neural mm -hmm. patterns, have you ever thought about, or do you guys, of 
um, associate that with the notion of quality of, of movement. Or, and, and so, you know, one, one idea of quality might be, well, um, you've, the goal of the movement, the, the, goal, the end goal of the movement, if that can be achieved with less energy mm -hmm. or something, then it's higher quality movement. Yep. And then, so, it seems like that, you know, that could be mapped, the, some notion of quality could yep. be mapped onto those patterns. And then, uh, more relevant, as the, really what I'm interested in is, my guess is that quality, and this goes back to the unit of analysis, an, an elderly person walking down an empty hallway, consider that, versus the elderly person walking down the hallway surrounded by rapidly, randomly moving three-year-olds. Sure. The quality of movement that's, I mean, in the latter case, you take sort of the individual in the, in the crowd mm -hmm. as the analysis. And I, I would think, unit of analysis, and I would think that the, the, you'd get completely different uh, 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 quality of movement sure. kinds of patterns. So, and, okay. So maybe let, we'll stop there and uh, let me try and answer a couple of those questions and then we'll see where we go from there. So I think maybe what you can appreciate from even the first slide that I put up, right? That was basically this, this idea of how neural activity changes across time. Very heterogeneous. Lots of things going on, um, right? Hard to kind of think about these very high dimensional spaces. From the aspect of quality of movement, it turns out if you take those high, dimensionally, high dimensional spaces and ascribe a dimension of interest, right? Quality, let's say, um, um, or dimensions that are important to the neurons to get done whatever task wants to get done. Move from here to here uh, in the shortest possible distance, being as energy efficient as I can. Um, it turns out that the brain is very good at minimizing variance along dimensions that are very important for the task that it's going to do, while letting variance in other dimensions that it doesn't care still be highly variable. So it turns out we can't do a whole lot of that with these data here because these are very, very, very overtrained movements, right? These monkeys make thousands of these movements every day, so they're doing things over and over and over again. Now, what we can do um, is play games with them. Let's see if I can find the slide. Wait, what are you looking at? Yep. I mean, one way that maybe comes to mind is instead of, you know, they, they move from out, up, out to the center. Yep. And then from the center to the right. Yep. Uh, but if the task was to move from up, to the center. Uh, to the right. Yep. No, to the yep. right. Yep, yep, yep. The higher quality of movement might be just to go straight. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And these are things that, uh, that we see them do. So I'll, I'll put this slide up for a second. So this is a task that, um, it's an adaptation task. So basically we have them making these movements and then we change the, we, we play a game with them. We basically rotate their visual space with respect to where their arm moves. Okay. So. Um, Early on, right, they're making, in this pre-adaptation period, they're making movements in eight directions. Then we switch them basically to a task where they're only going to have to move north. They only got to move straight. And basically, well, the game that we play here is, um, so this is their hand, and this is the visual cursor, right? So we dissociate the two such that their hand has to move this way for the cursor to go straight and for them to achieve their goal. And we basically look at how the neural activity changes while they learn this. So that's basically uh, what, we're, what we're doing here. You get a very nice linear map there, and it turns out that when we do that, oh, oh I don't have the right figure here. Um, you see very different kinds of neural activity. Uh, where do I wanna go, where do I wanna go? I'll go here to this last one, it's not great but it'll get the job done. Um, so this is kind of looking at neural activity in, high, in a very high dimensional space, where as they're kind of learning and as things are unfolding. So you can see as, as early in learning or when they're kind of learning this novel representation, we're in one space, and then it kind of progresses to another space as quality might improve. So I think you could map quality onto an axis like this in some That's way, really shape, or form. Um, so if I can 
Can I ask a, a, this is an Well, I don't know related. how much time we have. I'm happy to talk with you as long as, uh, yeah. Sure. Okay, so, so uh, one of the other things that I'm sort of obsessed about with movement sciences is yep. the idea of, is, is, is movement notations. So, there, uh, I ran across them because I have ballet tickets. And, okay. Um, and so, you know, there are different ones. One that I'm more familiar with is the Eshkol Wachtman, which is an Israeli lab notation. Okay. And so now I wrote this down. Okay. So I would not sound like an idiot. Um, okay, there we go. So my question is this. So it seemed like you were, you know, when we were talking about, uh, oh, did you get generalizability across monkeys? Yes. So, okay, here's the way I'd put it. It seems like you could take these similarity, maybe fuzzy similarity clusters of neural patterns associated with movement initiation and map that onto a movement patter, pattern rep as represented in one of the movement notations. If you could do that, that'd be really cool because yeah. you'd be crossing the... Hmm. I'm not familiar with what you mean by movement notations well, like so much. Well, like Waterman, it's, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's a three-dimensional space okay. that's represented. And, okay. And it's, it's just got a notation for, like, the arm comes up or if it's going to move I over see. here. Yeah, yeah. And that so, would be interesting. you know, they try to use it in choreo choreography. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I've never, I've never, I've not, I've not looked at... It just seems like it those would more work. kinematic kind of movement science kinds of things. Well, I mean, we're 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 fixed in a very small repertoire of movements here, yeah, so to speak. But still, but, but there's different there's different things to definitely look at. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Thanks. No problem. Uh, do you have any questions? I have a million questions. Sure. We can talk later. Indeed. Probably because my questions are related to plasticity and a work of uh, Anatole Feldman, yep. Cindy, yep. Levine, mm -hmm. Yale University. So, Madiha, Melody, I'm asking yes. you first. Or <laughs> <laughs> I was just, so I said that it's like, okay, cool. Um, so you're, what are you wanting to, like, with this research, you're able to identify the patterns of spatial yep. and temporal yep. notations. And so I see that you, are you planning to use this for, like, stroke patients in terms of rehab or in terms of, like, other neurological disorders to kind of, like, identify what can happen? And can you, like, especially I know a lot of neurological disorders, there's things yep. you can't correct. So what will... So, so this work is interesting, I think, from a couple different points of view. Um, a lot of what I've uh, here. Let's go. Let's grab this slide. So, uh, one thing that I've been very interested in are these ideas of brain-machine interfaces. So, right, if someone's paralyzed, um, they can't control their arm anymore. Can we use some kind of engineering technique, mm -hmm. measuring brain signals, controlling some kind of end effector? So that's basically what this task is, right? So we're interested, right, in how these patterns unfold how these neurons behave in these different contexts so we could build uh, better algorithms, basically, to transform the neural activity that we record into a control algorithm that can, could, could control a high, a high degree of freedom robotic arm so right, you could give someone back fidelity, right? Basically, a Luke Skywalker arm or something right. like that, right? Mm -hmm. So this task was something, basically, where we, we have monkeys make movements or watch movements um, and then we try and build a relationship um, through different techniques, through, from the neural activity to how he moved, right? Basically, a linear, linear regression is the easiest way to do it. And then we basically put him in a different task where we say, okay, now use that representation to actually move something around. So here we basically decouple the cursor from their arm and say, this cursor is now moved by this representation. So you hold your arm still, put it by your side, put it behind your back or something like that, right? And move this cursor around to hit targets. Um, so that's kind of one of the applications that we think about, is trying to understand how this neural activity unfolds as a function of time. So we have a better uh, idea to how to create these algorithms, one, 
And context is an interesting thing for me from the idea that you can imagine if you had one of these algorithms or movement descriptions, you might say, it might work in one state, but when you go to another state, it might not work so well. So right, how then do we change those uh, algorithms across time to you know, go from the task of I want to reach up and pick up my water bottle to I want to drive my car down the road and do that. So that's kind of where we think about them. Um, there are people who've used these kinds of brain machine interfaces, interfaces usually with EEG to kind of facilitate stroke rehabilitation right. to try and uh, reinforce patterns of activity that are, are related to movement. Um, yeah. Sorry, in some like human brains as well too. Indeed. So those are with stroke, like people who are typically they're people who are in the hospital to have epileptic foci mapped. Mm -hmm. So people have epilepsy. Uh, a lot of times the treatment for uh, epilepsy that's resistant to medications is to actually take the part of the brain out that's offending. So I, I mean, I know yeah. you can't put it in healthy brain subjects, right. but I would assume, I'm, maybe I'm making this wrong assumption, that a monkey brain is representative of oh, human yes. brain? Oh, yes. So that's, that's, how, they're how as close those, as we can, yeah. How does the brain like mapping from those subjects, some human subjects, relate to the normal of they the, look They look almost exactly the same. There's, there's uh, between, oh wait. Yeah, but between I'm the humans sorry. and the healthy monkey. Uh, they're they're almost monkey. exactly the same. The kind of, the, uh, the neural activity that we'll, we'll try and record in humans, mm -hmm. um, so imagine uh, epilepsy usually happens in the temporal lobe, so you'll have grids you know, kind of in this region here. The part of the brain that we're interested in is here, and it's right. usually not uh, affected by the epilepsy. Right. So it's kind of uh, something where we'll ask the subject, hey, you're having this surgery. Um, we're going to put a big grid in here. Do you mind if we put a little one in here too? So we're going to try and record uh, activity from healthy human brain, or as healthy as it, as it can be in those cases. And then, I think you might have already answered this question, I don't know, but like, so you were saying that you saw repetition. So with repetition, you can see that the, um, uh, there's a pattern that develops. Does mm -hmm. it also get, like, the neuroscopes get quicker as well, too, or is it just the shape of the pattern? Like, what is the... Um, the kind of refinements that you see often track behavior, right? So, um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a movement and all of a sudden I'm gonna change the world on you and I'm gonna rotate your visual feedback with respect to, um, you're gonna see right. I'm gonna move this way. The cursor is gonna go this way, and then so I gotta learn to kind of do that to make it go straight. Um, you're gonna see the neural activity tracking what the arm is doing, right? And then um, basically then. Like we were talking about variance before, the variance kind of along the dimensions that are important gets big. Um, and then as you kind of hone in on, okay, I understand what that permutation is now, and I can make that very straight ballistic movement, that variance then starts to shrink back down. So I think you can make, um, make an analogy to people who've had stroke. Um, usually what happens in a lot of cases, if you look at uh, their movements after stroke or um, um, as they're able to get better doing tasks like this after stroke, they have lots of variance in dimensions that aren't important. Um, and even important dimensions. And then they're able to kind of restrict that variance to kind of make better quality movements even though they can't quite always get back to the best quality of movement. And so I'm, I'm sorry, one more Yep, no. Okay. Like, um, so I see these, these patterns you have strictly for the forearm, hand, and wrist. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody done for the other parts, the other regions of the brain that take care of other movements? And do you, or do you think it would be kind of, you see the same I don't know if it's right to say the same patterns or same, same idea. So temporal structure seems to be conserved across species and across movements. Mm -hmm. um, so if we take a big high dimensional space and boil it down into some lower dimensional space, we see similar kinds of temporal progression of neural activity across species, across movements. Now, that doesn't mean that that space that we're looking at Right, is the same across all different movements. So it seems like there might be, right, the orientation of a plane might change, but the behavior within the plane tends to be conserved. And, and um, there's papers by, you could look at papers by Mark Churchland. Um, they've done it in monkeys reaching, monkeys locomoting, um, 
I think he even shows data from a lamprey swimming or something like that, kind of rhythmic kinds of behaviors. They all tend to be conserved. The kind of temporal structure of movement tends to be conserved across, across species. All right, so upper and lower, all right, so, so right, right, upper and lower are two different kinds of things. In a, in, well, it depends on the, um, the species, of course. But um, in humans, anyway, upper limb movement is a lot different than lower limb movement because a lot of lower limb movement tends to be related to central pattern generators in the spinal cord, kind of offloading some of that activity. So, um, and that, that happens in basically almost every animal. Chewing is another interesting system. That tends to be a very subcortical kind of movement. Yeah, so upper and lower are, are very different. Humans and monkeys, primates in general, um, have more well-refined upper limb movements just because of tool use. Um, so in, in, in things that have to have dexterous movements of their hands and digits and fingers, you see these very expanded representations and the kind of things that I've been talking about today. In, sorry, yep. Like, so in basically like the environment that these are conducted in, like I know if it's in a really cold environment, shivering, like that would like does that does that play into anything here? Because I, I like shivering, that's, and that would affect my like that would affect movements and everything. Shivering, or does it or any sort of like reaction to like yeah. the environment that like you control the environment that the experiment? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't I can't speak to shivering. I've I've never studied shivering. It's auto, It's a very autonomic kind of behavior. So. Yeah, I would think that, like, that could, I know it's kind of noise riding on top yeah. of things. I think it might just kind of increase motor noise. So I don't know. Indeed. Um, I would like to thank everybody for coming and please uh, thank Dr. Savinsky. Thank you.